This is Ranger Kidwell Ross, editor of WorldSweeper.com and the director of the World Sweeping Association. Our guest today, Ali Moulage, started working with Michigan-based CNJ parking lot sweeping when he was 17 years old. He stayed until the owner, Ray Conker, seen here with me a couple of years ago, sold the company in 2021, nearly 20 years later. Confer says this of Ali. He is a master mechanic who truly understands how sweepers operate. He knows what it takes to fix correctly any of the sweepers we've ever had. Ali was also great at searching out whatever parts we needed and then purchasing at good prices. When we would buy most any new model, he would end up calling the manufacturer to suggest changes that should be made in that model. And nine times out of 10, the manufacturer would end up making the change on their future model updates. Another skill of Ali's, Ray says, is that he was, he was very helpful that if they had a truck or a sweeper go down in the field, he could usually diagnose the problem on the phone. He'd give instructions to the operator to do this, try that, pull such and such wire, and almost always the sweeper was able to complete the shift without us having to send out another unit or tow that one. Ali's preventive knowledge was also key for C&J, Ray went on, in keeping major breakdowns from happening. He could spot any wear or tear that was occurring on a sweeper or chassis over time, and if a particular problem was cropping up on one of the company's trucks, he would look to see if the same problem was occurring on other units of the same model in our fleet. There's no question that Ali Milaj was one of the keys to C&J's success through the years. Ali got, first got his job by filling out an application from his auto shop class when he was in high school, applying to be a mechanics helper. He then got a notice to go to the responding business that turned out to be C&J. He was hired and then worked after school every day at four o'clock. At the time, the company had six small Timco parking lot sweepers and one street class sweeper. Their current mechanic was also into race cars, as was Moulage. And he was impressed when the car that Ali had built at 17, a 1981 Ford Cobra with a modified 460 he'd taken out of a Lincoln, blew by his own highly built red 1972 Roadrunner with a 340. Ali had been on the job for three days power washing when Mike told him to spray off a pony engine so it could go to a diesel shop. Ali not only troubleshot the engine while Mike was gone to lunch, he discovered the problem was with the, the push rods and he had the engine running when Mike got back. From then on, Ali was designated as a mechanic as well as just a helper. About then, he also made a tire rack, Ali said he's proud of, that stands to this day. Moulage went out on his own for nine months when he was 19, but found it was too much to handle both the business and the repair side at that age. Then during that time, Mike also got into a serious car accident and C&J asked Ali to come back. By this time, C&J had expanded to nearly 30 vehicles in the fleet. By the end of his time at C&J, Ali recalls there were about 60 vehicles to take care of. In 2009, Ali was invited to work behind the scenes on Discovery Channel's Monster Garage episode 13. They made two motorcycles that ran on ice, and Ali's team's design ended up as the winner. In 2013, Ali was on the Gears program on the Speed Channel with Stacy David. The show was called Curves of a Woman because on the show they built a 1952 Jaguar, you can see there, and the shape of the car was so amazing. In 2016, Ali was invited to be part of the pit crew for the Ford race team's GT40 vehicle in France at the 24 hours of Le Mans race. Their team won first, second, and third, although Ferrari was eventually given the third spot since it was discovered that one of the Ford units had a marker light out. That's the car that they, uh, the, one of the cars that they raced.
A movie was made of Ford versus Ferrari, and Ali went most every night after work to another facility to work on those cars until they got the 12 vehicles they needed for movie production. During all of the above, he still worked for C&J, fixing and repairing the company's ever-enlarging fleet of sweepers and other vehicles. Ali says he loved the work so much that it's like he never had to work for a day in his life, something we could all only hope for. Today, you'll get to hear Ali's coverage of what sweeper users should be looking for in terms of preventive maintenance and much more. And with that, let's invite Ali Moulaj to talk to you about preventive maintenance on uh, sweeping and other vehicles. And uh, you'll definitely benefit by what he has to say. Hey, Ranger. Yeah, thanks for having me again. Um, yeah. Like I said, I was looking forward to uh, getting down to uh, the various maintenance programs uh, that were uh, contributed to uh, some of our success. I think uh, um, the years uh, at for the years at C and J when I, we were when I was younger, like I said, I absorbed all that stuff and you know and seeing that. Um, if we changed oils enough, if we greased everything enough and changed the filters enough, it took the longevity of the particular sweeper that we were getting, say, two years out of, you know, we prolonged them seven to 10 years. Um, so like the, the 348 Schwartz, uh, that was a, a workhorse, uh, them early years, um, you know, we had, a, there was a couple tricks to where, you know, we changed the fan sizes uh, that helped us uh, a lot with the uh, not running the RPMs up so high. And uh, it was a, a, a fuel saving. We saved a lot of fuel because uh, we ran the, uh, the the rear engines pretty much at idle and they would do the same job for paper chasing, you know. Um, mm -hmm. Then, um, you know, the uh, 348s, we bring them in. Every truck in the fleet had their uh, uh, hydraulic filter replaced with a quality Wix, which is uh, that I prefer because it has a bypass in, in it. You know, uh, generally with a sweeper, anything that you could offer it, like a synthetic oil, um, filter with a bypass in it or um you know a uh a, uh, a radiator cap with a certain uh, re uh bypass in it um anything you could offer that and, and bolt onto the sweeper uh was uh it's always a great insurance for it because of the fact that running a sweeper company and let's face it everybody's been there to where they just were crunched and didn't have exactly uh, the time to, uh, you know, uh, maintenance that vehicle, and it would go past a week or two, you know, uh, before before you got to the oil change that needed to be done, or the the oil, uh, you know, filters that had to be replaced. Uh, so by by having a bypass in the filter, it is a uh, crucial that if the filter was to clog. Now you have restrictions going to your a um, hydraulic pump, which helps burn it up, and it runs your hydraulics hot, and uh, the sweeper will start uh, burning up hydraulic valves. It costs a lot of money, which that extra money you spent on that quality Wix filter was uh, that insurance is aut automatically paying and helping you out without you even knowing it. Um, that way, uh, it's like uh, having a, a, an employee watching over that you're not even paying. Uh, so with that synthetic oil, uh, you know, that, that synthetic oil is going to help you reduce friction at high RPMs, which is going to, you know, uh, uh, put less less wear and tear on your in internal engine parts. So let me, uh, I'll leave to ask, uh, so are you talking about chassis and uh, the pony engine on an auxiliary engine on a sweeper or just the auxiliary engine? Correct. 
Um, so Wix every place or, or just on the auxiliaries, for example? Wix on everything, every yeah. single thing. With, with a, you want to have a bypass. It's like, um, you know, waking up in the morning and saying, oh, it might rain outside. I'm going to take my raincoat with me just in case, you know, um, and uh, that's, it's always there. Um, uh, they're uh, amazing filters. I've never seen any of them fail in, uh, in 24 years. And we ran at one point, I think it was probably about 150 diesel engines on the fleet. So at, uh, that being said, you know, it, they're, they're proven. Uh, we use them in the, in the race car applications also. Um, so a Wix filter is a, a must on a sweeper. Um, Anybody else that says, you know, you're going to save a little money here, uh, or you, if you change the filter enough, you don't need the bypass. Well, what happens? This is the real world here, the real sweeper world. And let me tell you, you know, anybody that tells you that they've got their maintenance schedule on point to the, to the hour, to the T, that's not the real world there. I mean, so you know, going that extra mile and, and getting the, the proper uh, quality maintenance, uh, you know, filters and oil goes a long way in keeping your, your truck moving, keeping them brooms hitting the ground, which is what's making you money, uh, you know. Uh, so uh, you had an overall preventive maintenance program. What uh, Talk about that a little bit about, you know, what you did in terms of preventive maintenance on all of the, uh, your sweepers. I like the what uh, Ray Contra had to say about something you instigated, which is if you see a, a problem on a particular make and model of sweeper, go check and see if that problem is happening in uh, other of those make and model in your fleet. That makes perfect sense. And then look for it. it let's say you have a, a you know machine that's uh, three years old and it's happening to and now you have a couple of the newer units, well, you know, make a note someplace to uh, be sure to check that in the next year or, you know, keep track of the newer units too. But uh, what was your preventive maintenance uh, setup like? Well, see, we had a, uh, we had so much equipment and so many engines. We had a board on the shop wall that everything got logged on to. So it would go, you know, this particular truck and it, it had everything from, the sweeper pony engine to the in cab air filter on it, uh, you know, um, the uh, rear end, and it was all logged, you know, and everything we did, we logged every six months. The hydraulic oil filters were changed, regardless, regardless of that truck got a, a hydraulic filter six months go by and it only has an hour on it, we replaced it. Why? Because of the, the, the certain types of moisture that you, you uh, accumulate in your hydraulic system uh, when the weather changes. Um, you, know, uh, you know, I think it, it, a lot of people might think it's a little uh, strict or maybe nonsense, but uh, this is why we were so successful, I think, uh, moving forward. Uh, so we, we did the hydraulic filter every six months. The oil filters, oil filters were done. I had this uh, turned down there. Sorry about that. Yeah. Not a problem. Uh, oil filters, uh, oils were done every uh, 100 hours uh, on the rear engine. We, um, what we did is um, we would gather all the trucks together, warm them up, and one guy would go out and he would dump all the rear engine oils all at once. So it made it easier to log it all. So uh, everything in the fleet would get its uh, rear um, engines, oil, oil changes, and it would be logged. Then the next day you would do the, all the transmission filters as much as you could in one day. Then you log that and then the front engines all at once um it made it a lot easier on a fleet a, a larger fleet it makes it a lot easier to log everything and stay on top of it mm -hmm. you know for uh you know uh, mom and pop guys you know you could uh 
you know, uh, the sticker in the, in the window always helped for the, the front engine and the rear engine, you know, um, that, uh, that, that type of stuff, um, I'm sure will work, but what I found in the larger fleet doing it, it all together, all as one logging it. Now we know it made it easier to remember or log it, even though it's on the ball. Well, that particular truck had an issue when the, the uh, oils were changed. We did all of them at once. So you could help even use your uh, knowledge on when they were changed all at once for diagnostics purposes later too. So um, keeping up on that was a key thing. Um, and I want to jump in here to say for the mom and pops uh, now, most everybody has a calendar on their on their phone, on their computer, um, you know, whether it's a Google calendar, an Apple calendar, whatever you have. And uh, if only you only have a couple machines, make yourself a reminder, you know, go out when you change your oil. Now go out uh, and if you're doing, you know, you're doing it in terms of time and not hours or mileage uh, and make yourself a note. I would say a week before you're supposed to be doing that change, because if the notice pops up on the day you're supposed to go change the oil, you are not going to do it. But if it's the week, uh, you know, you know that uh, seven days after you get that notice, you're due to change the oil. Well, then uh, sometime in that intervening week, you can get the job done. But that's a reminder because a lot of times you're not out there. If you have two or three units, you're not out there on two of them. Um, to see what the sticker says in the window and that that kind of thing. So, um, yeah, go yeah more probably. Tech, technology has changed um, <laughs> in the last uh, you know twenty four years, and and we 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 adapted with it by um, integrating a uh, GPS system coupled with a diagnostic system that Azuzu now offers. It was a, an IDSS system that. Uh, we were a beta test site for originally with uh, Partech Azuzu uh, partnership. And um, they developed a, uh, a maintenance program that will log itself for us. Mm -hmm. the, the, the technician has to uh, Yeah, the technician enters the information in and then and then it's kept up electronically, you know, makes a lot of sense. Uh, these yes. and you talked about the importance of having the right diagnostic tools in house too. you feel like you save money over time. Yes, it, it might cost uh, a lot, but uh, um, I don't know how to get my phone completely off here. I guess I'll go to airplane. Um, how, how that. Uh, that part can can be as well. Um, so, so you know, talk now about that, the kinds of tools you think are are important to have in in house. Um, every every sweeper place should have, uh, you know, unless you just have one sweeper or however that works for you. Yeah, as far as that goes, uh, with diagnostics, um, early on. Um, you know, I, we all had our mechanical stuff, uh, all mechanical sweepers, and then it, it, the electronics came about, and and, and then we, everybody started noticing, you know, uh, ah, the mechanics. So let's let's get it down to the dealer and fi figure it out. So what happens then is, uh, you know, I started to notice that, you know, taking it to the dealer was uh, cutting uh, into our um, sweeping time so you know that broom not hitting the ground wasn't making the money even though it was say well it was warrantied i'd still find that it sat there for um months on end and then um and uh, you know they still couldn't figure it out so at, at that point i started getting our, our yeah the software myself and and then finding that uh, you know having the proper software and the hardware to to be able to diagnose them, we started, uh, you know, uh, we had zero down, downtime as far as uh, taking it to the dealer. So what we did is even when they were under warranty, we still, should we take this to uh, 
the dealer or should we fix it? Now we could fix it with $250 and have it up and running in 15 minutes, or should we down the truck, let it go to the dealer, they have to assess it to see if there is a warranty. And, you know, with sweepers, the dealer is number one for arguing about warranties. Yeah. Due to the, the, the nature that they're in. Uh, we've done studies with the uh, Zuzu for their warranty stuff there. And um, what, uh, with that, that being said, we always, you know, found ourselves not usually utilizing the warranties at all. Um, because of um, we uh, never had to, um, you know, uh, down our trucks or, um, you know, you know, spend that 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 time down that downtime is where we save our money. You know, I mean, if the transmission went out or something like that, that's another story. But uh, yeah, something like you say, you know, under two hundred fifty dollars. I mean, that's a nice round figure. How long does it take to make two hundred and fifty dollars in your sweeper if you keep it going? Not very long. So, um, yeah, I get that. Are there particular things that uh, you would do on, uh, you know, particular makes? Um, when you started, uh, there were you said there were six Timco parking lot sweepers. Uh, are there things on a Timco that are any different than uh, than things on a Schwartz, or certainly they are than a Nighthawk? But on uh, on those class of air sweepers, I mean, are there things that you check like the intake hoses and the the flaps and so forth uh, all the time or on a periodic basis? What kinds of things do you think uh, make a difference? So on the 348 versus the uh, the Timcos, everything's got their pros and cons in the industry. Um, 348 is a nice machine because uh, Schwartz was because the, the suction head was real simple. If it had a little bend in it or the, the rubber got worn, you flipped it out from underneath the truck and punched out the rubbers, popped them back in. Now the Timco had, was that regenerative air, the 210, that particular unit um, up north here, we didn't see them as popular uh, because of the suction heads were so, so large. It made it, uh, you know, real uh, bulky and, uh, you know, trying to get around the divots and all the bumps in, all, in our pavement here uh, and up north here, I think we have the best, worst roads in the country. Um, them suction heads would never fared well for us. Um, but it was an amazing machine still. Um, you know, everybody uh, got their uh, pros and cons with, you know, uh, Timco's, Schwartz's, all that, uh, that particular truck was a uh, real nice uh, air machine for sweeping parking lots. Now the um, the 348 Schwartz was more of an aggregate type truck. Uh, the pr uh, pros on that were it would, it would suck up pretty much a brick. The cons were it would uh, it, the uh, transition tubes always wore, the fans wore fast. And that was just uh, the nature of the beast. If you're gonna use it, this is what you uh, had to prepare yourself. Make sure you had the right stuff in stock to run that machine. And if you're gonna run it that hard. Um, most other places in the country we seen would probably average a year to a year and a half, maybe two years on a fan, which we were getting uh, in six weeks would be blasted gone here in Detroit. So uh, that's the difference there. Um, even no matter how much water you used, it was just uh, that's the difference in the, the, the aggregate. Uh, we sweep um, having the worst roads in, in the country really showed all the flaws in all the makes and models of sweepers. Um, that uh, the um, Nighthawk coming in into play, that, that particular truck was amazing truck because of the fuel efficiency the maintenance uh, cost and the parts on that particular truck were, uh, you know, pretty efficient as far as it uh, breaking down because it was used for a uh, purpose-built truck for 
paper chasing, you know, for doing the parking lots. Um, that is a, a, an amazing truck. If you're sweeping with anything else at night, you're wasting your money. You're, you're uh, happy with single engine um, machines and as, uh, you know, basic paper chasing on a parking lot. Um, at what point do you say we can't use a, a single engine machine? We need to go to a dual engine. Other time typically, or, you'll, or, yeah, go ahead. You'll typically see that uh, during the snow uh, melt. Uh, you know, up here in the north, if you a lot of places uh, ge geographically, you know, don't have that typical issue, but we do uh, here. When the snow melt, uh, then you'll really start to see that um, you can no longer use that particular truck for that job. Uh, you you want to bring in something. Uh, maybe a dual engine machine uh, or uh, some type of a mechanical broom truck like a uh, small husky um, or a small uh, you know non-cdl broom truck i would say because yeah. that's typically what you want to use in a parking lot sure you know for road sweeping it's different you know so um that was also a, a, a amazing truck the husky uh that uh, came out uh, in the late, uh, you know, nineteen uh, nineties. There, um, that uh, last kicked about, uh, and to this day, we're all kind of uh, mirroring that, mm -hmm. um, which is uh, a sweep right truck, which is now back in business and uh, stronger than ever. Yeah, um, that's the Lisco is a, is an amazing. Uh amazing innovator and designer that's uh, that's for sure what would you do different on uh, let's, let's move to broom trucks for a minute uh what kind of preventive maintenance uh, do you see there that needs to be done now see uh the the main thing on a, a broom truck is uh and everybody else i think would uh, agree is that uh, the chains or the belts um on the conveyor maintaining that conveyor which is pretty much the uh you know, the heart of that sweeper to keep it going. And, uh, you know, uh, yeah, there's pros and cons with the um, me uh, mechanical chains and the, the rubber belts. Um, I like the rubber belts because there's less maintenance, but every six months, you're going to have to change that belt. But, you you know, in six months, you that six months come along, you change that belt, it stretches on, it's got one tension and you don't have to touch it for six months. Chains, they're a lot more durable. You can pick up a lot more aggregate, but it's something that you sometimes have to adjust weekly, you know, uh, and then inspect, um, which, uh, you know, a lot of people will argue, uh, you know, the chains on my particular truck, I can, um, The chains on my particular, I take my chains and sweep anything with it. And oh, I don't have to worry about it for a year or this or that. Um, I've seen it firsthand. Uh, the, the rubber conveyors, six months, replace them, move on. It depends on what you're, um, you know, you're sweeping. If you're doing millings all the time or if you're doing the construction cleanup is not as difficult and not as wear uh, as much wear but uh, if what you're out there doing is millings all the time probably you want a machine with chain conveyor belt that you adjust because you're going to really stretch your uh, your rubber a lot faster and so forth so that's you know certainly something to think about how do you tell you say replace the rubber every six months how did you tell uh, did you go look at the, the current rubber and say, well, hey, we can get another month out of this or, um, or you know, we better go at five months. Uh, how'd that work? Mine was typically from experience as far as uh, learning that, um, you know, on a, on a rubber uh, belt machine, um, a, a road wizard we're talking about, the two strips, you'll have either two strips or a third strip and um, you'll see the cog holes starting to wear in them and what they'll do is eventually tear in, in six months now one good thing was um, by having strips 
you would uh, you could just re uh, repair or replace one of the strips or the um, by it being opened instead of a closed single sheet of rubber and it had uh, strips instead of that sheet you didn't have to worry about the dirt getting caught up and built into the rollers and rocks and unlocking the, the conveyor up that's the difference on a um, a, a rubber conveyor cog belt from sweep right versus say like a, a broom truck that would have like a uh, elgin per se with a uh, sheet belt conveyor with uh, the rollers that would wear out real fast and the the uh, rocks would actually get in and build up in between that sheet and jam the conveyor. You would have the, the scraper would scrape so much dirt off, it would build up, build up. Even I've seen it get three feet tall and then come off as one sheet and jam the, the roller, which would cause the catastrophic failure, you know, uh, your pump motor shafts, belts, tears, bearings, all that. Um, that right there was a, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, your, your pros and cons there with the mechanical chains. Uh, you could pretty much sweep anything with it and, and not have uh, to worry about it, but the chains would wear um, and you have to adjust them, you have to keep up on them. That on the topic of tires here, uh, for years it was a, a battle, you know, Chinese versus American. Uh, what tires were the uh, the best, uh, you know, filled or non-filled with the uh, sludge uh, and the sealant? Um, what and what worked for us and what I found and where we saved most money was we started buying new sweepers for manufacturers and they, they came with a 19.5 tire, uh, 19.5 all steel tire is because uh, due to the weight ratings on the chassis, they upgraded the chassis, the manufacturers started doing that. And, and then we noticed all of a sudden that that all steel tire that the truck came with originally from the manufacturer, Pazuzu per se, or Mitsubishi, because they're the ones that uh, typically always mounted the tires, mm -hmm. unless the sweeper manufacturer altered them. But uh, they would come with an all steel 19.5 tire. And then all of a sudden, we noticed that, um, you know, these tires were, were getting double the life, double the life and less problems, which are, is priceless these days in the middle of the night, uh, causing the problems of flats in the middle of the night. And uh, your drivers having to uh, deal with the, the problem, and you you get that call at night. So um, we started uh, moving forward and purchasing these particular tires, uh, all the all steel tires, and by doing so, um, we uh, realized that um, we were saving almost half the money. Uh, on our tires, uh, the the cost went up on the initial, but the the overall duration of how many tires we used that year uh, was uh, cut in half. So uh, that was a, a major uh, plus. Uh, how about uh, where you put sealant? Construction sites, yes. Uh, parking lots, no, or some other criteria. Well, when I uh, like I said, using an all steel tire. Um, I've noticed that, uh, you know, we use no sealant and uh, the nails would actually bend before they uh, penetrated the tire, uh, which was a great thing, you know. Um, not saying that they're bulletproof or nail proof, but uh, we reduced the cost on our sludge and the amount of sludge we used. Um, I call it sludge, the tire sealant. Yeah. So. The, uh, the tire sealant, uh, you know, and so we put enough in our tires just to help balance the tire out uh, on the front tires, actually. Some, uh, you know, the recommended three ounces, I think, per tire or something will help uh, balance the tire, and it also uh, helped uh, any type of punctures. I mean, it's, sure. it's good, to, you know, to use it. Uh, 
you know, in in um, any any of the construction heavy duty applications there. Okay. So, uh, but uh, uh, a all steel tire on a night uh, parking lot sweeper, a uh, paper chaser, uh, it'll go forever. So, <laughs> so you can't it'll see my too. Yeah, that's good. Yeah. Um, so. Okay. Uh, you know, there's been a lot of problems with uh, the new tier four diesels uh, with once we started with def fluid and and uh, because sweepers are going so slow and they're not, uh, you know, really regenerating like they should. What do, what did you find about that? Do you have any comments to offer people about on that topic? Yes, actually, uh, the def issue uh, these days. Uh, is number one issue that uh, a lot of people I'm seeing have uh, problems with with the uh, their chassis diesels and their auxiliary engines. Um, so first off, you want to you want to use uh, make sure you're using the proper fuel and additive. So the proper fuel and additive goes a long ways because in 2007 the federal uh, EPA reduced the amount of uh, sulfur that was uh, in, uh, allowed in our fuel which uh, lubricated your fuel injection system. And um, a lot of the trucks on them years were designed for the fuel to cool uh, the injection system and lubricate it. Well, you know, there was a lot going on at the time. We had depth being introduced, uh, low sulfur being introduced, and the engineers were still on uh, high pressure, low volume, fuel injection systems that lubricated their self with, with fuel. So, um, you know, a lot of people are still trying to run them trucks and you wanna try to make sure you have the proper fuel additives to add that lubricity back, um, you know, to the, uh, to the fuel uh, and make sure it's compatible with your uh, depth filters. When I say depth filter, your uh, particulate filter and the exhaust and then also the using the proper def fluid and maintaining this is a number one issue that I see with def is maintaining the filter for the def tank. There's a filter in the tank on all his issues, which gets clogged, burns the pump up. Most people don't realize or can see the filter, even no one's there. And they're spending usually average fifteen hundred to two thousand dollars when that problem occurs um, at the dealer, and that can all be prevented by just taking and uh, maintaining that filter every six months when you do your hydraulic filters for the sweeper. Okay. So, um, how about the the def fluid itself? Uh, do you recommend buying in bulk and not buying you know individual packets or anything like that? The individual packets are nice because the uh, the amount of urea in them uh, is suspended in in that liquid, and and when you buy bulk, that uh, urea and the uh, glycol level can be thrown off. Mm -hmm. So uh, that what it is, yeah, Thank you. yeah. So uh, when you get quality, if you want quality oil, it's the same thing. You get bulk oil, or you, you get your it's uh, due to the fact that uh, the oil in a quart versus, you know, just like your depth fluid in a small package, the detergents that are uh, meant to be suspended and can easily be shook up or, you, you know, or when you dump it into the vehicle, it would shake itself up, mix itself properly. You know, it's, um, you know, uh, that's uh, your preference there. But what I find is using the, uh, I think it's a two and a half gallon is what they offer them in as uh, for, for depth. Um, and they have a, a peak and then now they have a, a ultra gold peak. And what that does is it changes the glycol level. So your freezing conditions were, <coughs> excuse me, will be met um, and actually uh, will um, freeze less. And that's why uh, when you use that bulk, the oil, uh, a, a, you know, like a, a, your bulk oil and your bulk def, 
the bulk def, you'll tend to see freeze more than the package def. Okay. Because it does have a, a freezing point. Mm -hmm. Sure. You know, um, so, uh, you know, like that, that filter and using the proper def uh, is always a big thing. And make sure that um, if anything was ever con contaminated into it, uh, say you're at the, the, the gas station and someone is filling it and they realize, oh no, uh, we've got gas in there or diesel or some other substance. Do not start it. Get it towed, and it saves you a lot of money and time. Mm -hmm. You know, because uh, I see things, a lot. One of the things I learned uh, back when I first got into this industry, my uh, my wife was a research scientist with NASA, and she developed super alloys for NASA, and uh, they would test them out on the what they called the vomit comet that that airplane that goes from uh, twenty thousand feet up at a 45 degree angle to 40,000 feet over and then comes down to 20 again. And you have 90 seconds of zero gravity. Zero gravity, yeah. So what she would do is to have these different super alloys that they would invent uh, in a molten solution. And then while you were in zero gravity, she would run a cooling rod down that uh, as she was floating there in space um, and, and cool the, the super alloy. And the theory is, and it's, you know, the well-documented fact of the matter is that there are contaminants in everything, no matter how well you try to manufacture it, keep it, whatever, and that you're much better off having those contaminants, like in zero gravity, would be randomly dispersed throughout your sample rather than settle to the bottom with gravity as gravity uh, creates. Yeah, atmosphere and pressure, yeah. Yeah, and so... Yeah. So that's a, that's a, a rule of thumb that uh, that is certainly true with whether it's deaf fluid or oil or gasoline, uh, diesel. Uh, the the pros say if uh, if you're going to get fuel and there's a truck there uh, filling a, a tanker truck filling the service station's uh, big tanks, do not get fuel out of that tank because you're disturbing whatever pollutants have gone to the bottom and now they're coming up on you. But um, so, you know, what you say makes sense all the way up to NASA and the space program. So just as, as a confirmation that, uh, you know, that makes a lot of sense. Yes, uh, you know, and it, uh, you know, it, it's what will keep your truck going, you know, if you just follow these couple simple rules, you know, and, that uh, type of, you know, it's, it's nice to be uh, educated in it and, and pass it on to anybody else, just like your backpack blowers. Say, we, we had a, uh, years ago, we had a uh, program where we had a, a, a small engine mechanic that came in and repaired the small engines because uh, we had so many blowers, so many trucks going out, and we had so many failures and it was, you know, due to the, the, the dusty environment, uh, the two cycle oil and the gasoline. Uh, now see, um, I eliminated that whole program by just a couple steps. Um, so I first started with a, a full synthetic oil, which was almost three times the price of the two cycle, uh, the, uh, you know, the normal two cycle oil. And then I, I coupled that with a wreck fuel that has zero ethanol. And we we buy that fuel and they would uh, come in and fill a 500 gallon tank every uh, month or six weeks, I'd say. And that wreck fuel and two cycle, uh, uh, the proper synthetic two cycle uh, Intex uh, oil, it we we seen virtually zero problems in our night uh, blowers and I mean, and we had to maintain them uh, once a year as far as the the the, the, uh, the spark plugs in them. It reduced that, and then the filters. Um, you know, we we still did our fuel filters and the air filters would be the only thing. I mean, other than that, we never had any issues. They just kept running and running and running from years on end. After that yeah, program, I, was that, uh, I agree completely. Uh, the importance of uh, using non-ethanol fuel is just really important, uh, especially yeah. anything 
storing, it'll eat the uh, rubber, uh, any kind of rubber hoses or that kind of thing. But uh, the other one that I'd bring up is to have the same person doing all of your fuel mixing when you're doing your fuel mixing. Don't let, you know, this Bob go out and, and mix a batch of uh, backpack blower uh, oil and gas this time and yeah. Fred does it next week or something like that. Get the That's the key guy, thing, yeah. A key thing. Yeah, and have them all yep. be the same. If you're, uh, and if you're out there and somebody says, hey, my backpack blower is smoking, better see what that oil mixture is and see if the rest of them might be smoking too or, or not yeah. you know, running right. Because boy, you can, with a, with a batch of bad, uh, especially if you don't get enough oil, uh, you know, you can toast a whole batch of backpack blowers pretty fast. Yeah, all it takes is one driver, you know, uh, and make sure the driver also is a good thing that they're, um, they understand, you know, how two cycle works. Because sometimes you'll get some at a gas station, you know, uh, some people uh, fill up at different gas stations and they'll fill up their gas, you know, they're, oh, oh no, I need gas and fill up their two-cycle bottle with, uh, you know, pump gas. And then, you know, then somehow that, that five gallons makes it in, in you know, in, into the box and everybody else is using it. Hmm. Recipe, recipe for disaster there. So yeah. I've seen it firsthand. So. Uh, another key thing was I found the keeping the uh, fuel containers properly cleaned. Mm -hmm. A lot of people don't, uh, you know, uh, you know, making sure that they're uh, stored away and uh, in the in the compartment that in keeping that compartment clean is a major uh, issue that I have noticed because when you, your fuel filters would get clogged, almost fifty percent of the time was the driver grabbing the tank your five gallon gas can and opening the gas cap and opening the cap on that and all the dust that has accumulated on top of the uh, gas tank uh, can it would, would go into your blower sure. and, uh, and they would never even think twice about it. Uh, it's normal to them. Uh, but, uh, uh, you know, as a professional's eyes and, you know, you would, you know what the, the issue is. And so, I, I recommend too uh, to people when uh, your gas can is empty and you're going to refill it, take a look down in there and see what uh, if you got any anything, little particulates and stuff in the bottom of that can. A lot of times you will, or water bubbles or something like that, and, and you know make sure to clean it out really well. Uh, you know if that's if that's the case. Every six months we bought new new ones. Um, uh -huh. Because uh, it was a uh, it was an ongoing battle. Um, even though you know uh, every six months that the cost of that and you know the two cycle oil and all that, it saved our blower program. Uh, to this day, I mean, we had blowers that ran for eight years nonstop. You know, um, mm -hmm. and uh, never had any issues. Just a, a spark plug and a fuel filter. Yeah. You know, air filter also blow out the air filter, put a new air filter in, keep on trucking. I mean. Um, that was uh, a far cry from where we used to be. I mean, that would be blowing, wouldn't it? Uh, <laughs> I think that's a Grateful Dead, but keep on blowing now. That's keep uh, on blowing. <laughs> hey, what, what else should we talk about here? Uh, this has gone on pretty long, but uh, you know, invaluable information, especially for anybody that's uh, you know doesn't have these kind of knowledge and programs uh, in place. Well, you know what? Uh, what I find was. Uh, Making sure you have the proper diagnostic equipment goes a long way these days. Mm -hmm. so you are not having to uh, guess or guess and throw parts it eliminates us all uh, most of the time it eliminates that, and, and then uh, the stress for your mechanics on uh, knowing uh, the systems are so complex now. You know, you've added a whole other uh, many more computers to the equation. Um, and uh, you know uh, it's almost a shot in the dark even when you have the software so that's how complex uh, the sy uh, systems are being uh, built you've got 2,000 engineers building this thing and then you got the you know a, a handful of sweeper engineers building all kinds of equipment on top of it and then you've got one mechanic that's got to figure it all out yeah and, so, and, then, and then he he uh, gets it fixed and he sends it out with a $15 an hour driver and a $100,000 sweeper at night 
with no supervision. What could go wrong? <laughs> oh, goodness. That's yeah, it. that was... Uh, I hate to say it, at one point in my life, I said to myself, I have to stop doing such an amazing job when I assemble these things. Because it's like doing, you know, Picasso painting an amazing painting, and then all of a sudden someone coming up with a sledgehammer and just taking it out. <laughs> That's not how I would, I would feel. I mean, I'd go the extra mile to make it look good and then actually uh, you know, take pride in it. And then then it'd come back to the shop, you know, on a tow truck, you know. <laughs> You fix it right. You don't up. necessarily need to, you know, port and balance it. Uh, uh, either it's not a it's not a race car. So uh, yeah, it's a balance. I find that I found the balance, and it made made a lot more sense in life. It made a lot more money for, uh, for yes the organization too. Um, so uh, if unless there's something else we should talk about that's uh, you know sitting there for you, uh, let's talk about where you're going from here. I know uh, you decided you were. Um, you know, going to uh, have some time here. Uh, you've been working pretty much nonstop at least one job for uh, since you were 17. So um, do what are your plans for the future uh, somewhere down the road, 2022? Or is that anything you can talk about? So, you know, um, walking away from, um, you know, uh, that my, my the past there or everything that happened uh, with with Ray and all that um, it's like opening a new chapter in uh, in the sweeper world here for me you know um, um, I do have a uh, currently uh, own a uh, a diesel repair facility um, where we do a lot of diagnostics for people uh, you know I have all the latest and greatest uh, softwares for every major manufacturer. And uh, also I've worked with every major manufacturer pretty much from uh, Cummins, Isuzu, uh, Deutsch, um, uh, on a lot of uh, the beta test siting stuff. Um, you know, uh, so that there is where I'm kind of going to shift gears into um, trying to stick with uh, that diagnostics type stuff and consulting to, um, other people in the industry, uh, helping them with their, uh, you know, uh, issues and, uh, and, and sweepers um, in the sweeping world, as far as, um, you know, working on uh, truck from more, everything from working on trucks to running, uh, you know, the day-to-day -day operations. Um, is what uh, I see myself uh, doing as far as uh, consulting. And then uh, at the same sense, uh, we have uh, Oliver's Diesel Specialist here, which is uh, the company I, I have now. And uh, we're doing all the, uh, the diagnostics and diesel repair uh, for anybody that, uh, that needs it done, you know? And there is a lot of that going on these days. So, so uh, I'm gonna focus uh, more on that and I'm, Coupled with uh, Sweep right there, I'm working with them. Uh, they're uh, I'm the Midwest uh, region uh, sales and service for uh, Sweep Right Manufacturing out of uh, Canada. Um, so uh, great people to work with, uh, amazing quality uh, equipment, um, and it's uh, you know shown uh, the. the uh, you know, 20 years go by, they still still running them. So uh, they've I've done something right, you know. That's so sure. uh, they have a lot of copies out there of uh, that Husky, too. Uh, it's oh, amazing yeah. how many other machines are pretty darn close to the Sweet Bright Husky. Yeah. Uh, well, yeah, we we had the first ones in, ever built, actually, at CNJ. Wow. Yeah. So we were like a beta test site for them, too, you know. Uh, um and it was amazing stuff at the time trust me um seeing it all yeah i mean unfortunately uh you know um no one's changed it uh, they've all copied that design and you know they've had their own little versions but uh i'm yet to see uh you know uh, what the future is us you know um uh, what new designs there are you know and uh, i'd like to be a part of it all uh, 
regardless, um, you know, um, yeah. uh, being uh, uh, together in the in the, in the sweeper uh, world, you know, um, uh, the, well, I think what I'm trying to get to is anybody I've known, and most of the time, I come across somebody that just are getting into the sweeping industry. I find myself telling them that now they're going to be in it for the rest of their lives. <laughs> Unfortunately, sometimes, <laughs> but uh, uh, I always said it's a hundred year contract. Because yeah, it's, uh, you're, you're, you're always going to need sweeping. You know, I tell my I kids that, all the time. In, that uh, in that category somehow uh, uniquely. So, yeah, yes. And you did an amazing job and thank you for everything uh, you've done for the industry. Oh, thanks, Ali. Yeah. Oh, yeah. That means a lot coming from you, and it's yeah. been great to uh, be around you, uh, uh, you know, as well. So that's uh, sure now that we're patting each other on the back. That's probably as uh, good a place to stop this as any. And uh, and yeah, I, I really yeah. thank you for taking the time uh, out of your schedule to help others in the industry as you have done for so many years. Yeah. So everybody, here's uh, here's your extra credit uh, uh, brief video uh, with Ali talking about the emergence of electric uh, vehicles, electric sweepers, and uh, you talk about uh, being a sales and service uh, center for Sweeprite, and they just came out with their uh, new uh, electric sweeper, the the first uh, that we've seen in the parking lot sweeping uh, industry. So, uh, and I know that. Uh, Ray Confer, uh, your old boss at CNJ, said that you've long been interested in uh, electric and so forth. So, uh, talk about that for a minute. Well, uh, yeah, uh, Sweep Ray came out with the new Raven this year, and it uh, actually at the show we were at with it, it uh, had the biggest crowd around it. Uh, it's an amazing little thing, but um, it's fully electric. And um, I could see the industry maybe moving towards that. I always said uh, that uh, we would be there one day. And now um, we've got a uh, lithium ion battery uh, cells that were uh, produced for the military from A123 systems that we're now going to uh, install into the Raven and see how much further we should double the battery life 12 hours consistent use uh, is what we're thinking on that particular unit with these particular, just one battery. So, I mean, uh, if we were to add three batteries, we'll see. We, uh, you know, we'll see what the future holds there uh, as far as that goes. But I can see um, hybrid electric sweepers are already been around, um, fully electric. Is something uh, maybe we'll see here uh, around the corner that's gonna you know uh, take take shape, and we'll see how how the demand in the industry um, wants it. Uh, you know, what I think is uh, certain applications, certain industries, it'll work versus uh, other uh, you know applications. You know, uh, we'll, we're yet to see a full road sweeper. Uh, that's electric that'll sweep asphalt but um i uh hope to get us there so. well and uh i think you you'll be able to if uh, if anybody can and once we have electric chassis and it's not going to be long till that's really going to be what's available or electric chassis then uh it makes sense that uh, somebody will come up with a way to you know do heavy duty sweeping on that all electric on that electric chassis. So I look forward to seeing, uh, you know, how that that part turns out. Well, yeah, you know, um, it was amazing growing up at a young age amongst all you guys, helping me, everybody in, in uh, the whole industry, helping each other. Uh, I'm 40 years old and um, there's so much more to go. And I'm looking forward to seeing uh, where, you know, uh, where this is going to take us in, in, in say, 15, 20 years. Um, and it, I'm just so uh, proud 
to being a, a part of it all. And it, uh, like I said, it's like uh, never working a day in, our, uh, in my life. Uh, I enjoy it so, so much. And uh, we'll see uh, what the, you know, what the future holds here. Well, when that happens, uh, be sure to let me know, even if you have to say, Ranger, Ranger, wake up. Come on. Hey, I want to tell you about electric. Remember? You get, were... up, get up, get up. That's right. You remember <laughs> what a sweeper is, don't you? Come on, yeah. come on, you can do it. Not a sleeper, but it's... it's... <laughs> All right. Thanks for that extra time, uh, Ali. And uh, I, look, I look forward to that uh, as well. We'll see what... Yeah. How it all goes. Thanks. How it all goes, for sure, Ranger. Well, excellent. Um, you take it easy, man. Yeah, enjoy your evening. You too. Thanks. All right, Ranger. Later, brother. We'll see you.